What up, HyperChange? Welcome to another episode. Just hopped off the Tesla Q3 2017 earnings conference call. Got all my notes right here. Let's run through them. Elon Musk starts the call saying he's reporting live from the Gigafactory. He's always on the front lines of every problem that Tesla has. The Gigafactory is at the crux of production hell right now, so that's why he's there. He went on to say he's super proud of the Tesla team. They've achieved 250,000 cumulative deliveries thus far. That's up from only 2,500 five years ago, a 100x increase in Tesla's fleet size. He goes, on to say kind of poking a jab at all the skeptics saying which one of you skeptics predicted that we would have a hundred fold increase in our fleet size in just five years so that was kind of funny okay then he talks about Model 3. He says there's no fundamental issues with Model 3 production, but there's bottlenecks. And you got to remember here, there's thousands of parts coming from thousands of suppliers. The supply chain and supply process can only move as fast as the slowest part. So there's a bunch of different things going on. He went into some nitty gritty here saying there's four zones of battery production, zone one, two, three, and four. Zone one and two, a subcontractor totally dropped the ball. They've had to recode everything from scratch. They're going through that right now and they're working their way through those difficulties. He thinks he's sees the light at the end of the tunnel and they're going to be able to get through this. He talks more about Model 3 production hell later in the conference call, so we'll get to that there. Then he goes on to say like, look, okay guys, we have a delay in trying to achieve 5,000 units per week by the end of this year and now it's got shifted back three months. But you got to put things in perspective, take a step back, and remember this is a 10-year program in the making. So a three-month delay is nothing really in the grand scheme of things and they're still going to be able to hit those targets and it sounds like they're very confident they will hit that 5,000 unit per week production run rate at the end of Q1, but we'll see. Also, he went on note that him and JB are working non-stop. You know, they're at the production line in the Gigafactory at 2 a.m. on a Sunday morning on the front lines, fixing this stuff, working around the clock. Wanted to note, like, what other auto company is doing that? What other executives gives enough of a shit to be on the factory floor coding robots themselves? No one's. I love the hustle. Tesla's management hustle is so much astronomically higher than every other auto company. I just love it. They're scrappy. They work their asses off. They'll work 24 seven around the clock until things work. And that's why they're doing the impossible. Love this part. Elon ends his opening remarks by saying that he saw a bunch of articles about saying that Tesla fired hundreds of employees. He said that the journalists who wrote these articles should be fired for a lack of journalistic integrity. Hyperchange literally put out an episode exactly like this, comparing that Tesla had only laid off two to three percent of their workforce relative to the average turnover in tech, which was 15 percent. This was no news, yet everybody made a huge splash about it. Elon goes on a rant. It sounds like he's freaking watching Hyperchange. Just I don't know. Anyway, that's a joke, but it was really cool to hear Elon back up the statement that we've been saying, which is these headlines that get reported about Tesla are so sensationalized sometimes. You really got to look into the facts and see what's actually going on before jumping to any conclusions. And it then concludes it by saying, and what you didn't hear reported is that thousands of employees were actually promoted during the same process and more than half of them were in the manufacturing segment. Consumer Edge, coming in with the first question, says, how does the delayed Model 3 projection change your margin trajectory? Essentially, they are kind of skirting around the answer here, but really Really they're saying our long-term goal of getting to 25% gross margins for Model 3 is exactly the same. We're just slightly delayed. There's no overall long-term things that are going to impede margins of the car. And we're very confident that we can achieve that 5,000 per week run rate by the end of Q1. Elon at the last second can't help himself and says, yeah, by the end of the year, I think we'll be making thousands of cars per week. So maybe not 5,000, maybe 2,000. I don't know. We'll see. Adam Jonas coming in, our boy. This time he's not asking anything about SpaceX. Adam Jonas, you still haven't replied to my email. What's good with that? Anyway, he comes in and asks them, okay, so you said you're going through production hell, but what level of production hell are you in? Is it getting hotter? Is it getting colder? What's good, Elon? Elon goes on to say, shit, if you asked me three to four weeks ago, I was depressed. We were at level nine of production hell. Like he made up some scale, I guess. But now they're coming down to level eight, almost at level seven. He said, according to him, he thought they would already be at level seven by now. I don't know. This is Elon speak, not making much sense. But the bottom line is he sees the light at the end of the tunnel. It sounds like the worst of production hell is behind them. And now they have a path and know what they need to do to be able to execute to get to that 5,000 a week number. It's just taking longer. Baird comes in with the next question. Okay, so you said it's way easier to manufacture the Model 3 than the S and X. Why is that? JB and Elon come up here saying basically it's just all automation. The Model 3 is so much more automated. And they give us some interesting color here, which I wasn't too stoked about, but they were basically saying because it's so automated, if one part of the automation process is broken and we have to do it manually, it's really, really hard to do it manually. And that's what's been going on now. And that's been the reason for the delay. But in the long run, this massively more automated process than the Model S and X will allow them to produce hundred, like a factor of 10 more cars at an equal gross margin because they're using robots instead of people. But interesting 
interesting to note that if the robot isn't working, it's really hard for them to fix the process, it sounds like. Nomura coming in with a great question. Okay, autopilot hardware, what's good with that? And then the analyst says, we are in an NVIDIA conference today where they said they just unveiled a computer processor that's 10 times more powerful than what's in the Tesla today. So what do you think, Elon? Are you still gonna be able to achieve level five autonomy with your hardware suite in the car? really not stoked about this answer. Elon goes on to say, and this is, you know, I've been making videos about this. It seems like there's a lot of problems going on with autopilot. They've been super slow to update it. They've been having a bunch of executives that are leaving that division leave. So I've been really curious what's going on with the autopilot program. And here we got some interesting color where Elon goes on to say like, yes, you will be able to achieve driving as good as a human with our current hardware suite. But I don't know if regulators are gonna say that that's good enough to let the car drive itself. You might need to be 10 times better than a human driver to have full autonomy or 100 times. So, you know, Elon's confident and he's already backing down on the claims that this is really going to be level five autonomy. Now he's kind of promising that, yeah, the hardware suite we have now will be as good as a human eventually. And then goes on to caveat it by saying, in the worst case scenario where we do have to upgrade computers for all these people, it's just a plug and play. We'll plug in the new computer, but it is important to note, Tesla will bear the cost for this. And since October, 2016, they've been promising that all of their cars come with the hardware necessary to do level five autonomy. And they're waffling on those claims. I'm still really curious here and we'll be following the autopilot's updates super close because I think we haven't heard the whole story here. And then at the end of that whole uh, situation, Elon goes on to say, but I will note, I'm really confident we have by far the best strategy of autopilot, kind of subtly trying to jab other automakers. I don't know, I didn't get good vibes from that. Then an analyst was like, hey, what about the customer deposit you mentioned? You said that that was really strong. Can you tell us how many more Model 3 orders you have? Of course, they're not gonna disclose that. It was like, dude, you could also just read the balance sheet in the quarterly letter and figure out how much the reservations increased and do some extrapolation. So I did that. Reservations last quarter were 664 million. Now they're 686 million. Who knows how much of the backlogs are getting eaten up and grown, but that's net like a $25 million increase. You know, if we assume that it's about $1,000 per Model 3 reservation and all of that increase was just to Model 3s. Maybe they added another 25,000 net orders of Model 3 to the backlog, which is pretty good given they haven't even sold anywhere close to that amount. John Murphy, Bank of America, some interesting questions about how the company has 2.5 billion in inventory and whether they'll be liquidating that to improve their cash position because maybe they need more cash now that Model 3 is there. Once again, Tesla sticking to the claim though that as Model 3 production ramps, cash flow from operations will turn positive very quickly. Most of the CapEx is done for Model 3, even though they have to spend a billion next quarter. After that, it should be pretty minimal. And if they can ramp production like they're saying, then they won't have any cash flow issues and their current cash cushion looks like it'll be enough. But it's interesting to note they were kind of skeptical about making any exact claims about what CapEx for 2018 will be. My guess is because it's gonna involve something to do with the semi truck, maybe Model Y or other products that haven't been announced yet. Also, they did say that some other minor CapEx like store growth and superchargers is slowing because now that they have a three month delay on when a bunch of Model 3s are gonna hit the road, it makes sense to delay the rollout of a bunch more superchargers by three months. So so therefore they can kind of scale this CapEx ramp with ramping production. Then he goes on to say, so what's up with the 10,000 unit a week run rate? Remember in the last conference call, you said you were gonna get to 5,000 units per week by the end of 2017 for Model 3, then by 2018, sometime in the year, 10,000, is that still gonna happen? They basically said it's too early to make that prediction, but we're still on track to get to 10,000 and we wanna wait to see what kind of CapEx we need to spend to get to 5,000 so we know better how to spend to ramp production from 5,000 a week to 10,000 per week. I don't know, so pretty gray answer there. I mean, my guess is they could still hit a 10, 10,000 unit per week production run rate by the end of 2018 if everything goes smoothly earlier in the year, but that's yet to be seen. Follow-up question once again, if you only do 250,000 units a year at Model 3, can you still hit that 25% gross margin? Deepak once again gives the answer that our gross margin targets for Model 3 are not changing at all. They're still 25%, it's just a delay to get to that number as it takes longer to ramp production. But in the long term, our gross margin profile of 25% for the Model 3 is still 100% on track. Alex Piper with Piper Jaffrey asking a smart ass question. So if that sub contractor messed up the battery building that you did earlier could you sue him or have him recoup some of the costs since it was his fault and then elon says very mature answer which i like because he's like look at the end of the day, everything's our fault and it's even my fault. Like we picked the wrong subcontractor. It took us too long to figure out what was wrong with the subcontractor. This is on us. This is our fault. We're not gonna switch the blame. We're just gonna learn from this and get better. I like that kind of a mature, feel good answer. So a follow-up question for Potter, another good one here. He said that gross margin was coming down for S and X and what was good with that this quarter. Then they answered that they had a product shift mix that negatively impacted gross margin. They switched and stopped selling the 90 kilowatt hour battery pack. And then they had some of the 90 kilowatt cars in inventory, they wanted to get rid of those. So they reduced the price and that's part of the reason we're seeing gross margins get hit. Also, they went on to say that they added more value in the Model S and X 
to differentiate it from the Model 3. Particularly with the Model S, they added things like air suspensions always included because they really wanna make sure that the Model 3 is kind of the standard mid-tier product and the Model S is really viewed as a luxury premium product that warrants paying significantly more for the car. And while that goes on, this was a temporary headwind to gross margin as well as they get rid of those 90 kilowatt hour inventory cars, which it sound like may even continue into next quarter. They go on and ate some interesting market share statistics. In Q3, the Model S outsold the Mercedes S-Class two for one. And remember, the Mercedes S-Class isn't electric. They're outselling uh, uh, gasoline cars like crazy. They outsold the BMW 6 and 7 series and the Porsche Panamera combined in Q3 as well. So the, the, the market share dominance of the Model S is incredible. And remember, if you extrapolate similar market share dominance for the Model 3's lower price segment, that is hundreds of thousands of cars per year in the US alone. Remember, there's 800,000 cars in the small to mid-sized vehicle segment in the US. The Model S has 30% market share of its market. If the Model 3 got 30% market share of that, that would be 250,000 units per year in the US alone. So the demand for Model 3 is going to be incredible if it sees any of the same market share gains that the Model S or X have. Then another kind of like minor detail here, but apparently they had three lines running Model S, X production that were doing about 2,000 units per week. Now they've shifted that third line to help with Model 3 production because they need more personnel and equipment. So now they're only producing 1,800 units per week on those two lines, but they think they can slowly boost the efficiency of Model S and X production to 2,000 per week on just those two lines, which means they have less man hours per car, which in the long run could help gross margins, and that will still be able to produce cars at 100,000 unit run rate. What I thought was interesting here is they're kind of guiding like, look, Model S and X sales are kind of peaking and flatlining around 100,000 units per year. It doesn't sound like they're expecting or planning for too much growth there. Now, that's not a bad thing because the Model S, as I've said, dominates its category and market share. If, you know, there's only so many rich people in the world that can buy these cars, if they already are selling to 30% of them, like how much more can they go, you know? The next best competitor in market share is like 10% or 12%. You know, same thing with Model X here. So they're getting to start reaching maturity or what the auto industry calls peak sales in their given categories. And that's why it doesn't seem like Tesla's planning much growth in Model S and X sales from the current 100,000 unit per year run rate. The other interesting tidbit though, is they do actually think they're gonna increase Model S and X sales in the next quarter, despite decreasing production because this production line switch over to Model 3. And that's because they're gonna be selling more inventory cars. So they do actually expect a record quarter of S and X sales in Q4, but maybe that's temporary as they sell off these inventory cars. Deutsche Bank, how should we think about CapEx for next year? What does the CapEx look like from the ramp to five to 10,000? Apparently that is pretty significant as you said on the last call. They go on to say, eh, we don't really want to give guidance on CapEx for next year. We can do it on the next quarterly call. We need to see things through better. But if there's one thing we do know, it's that it will take us less CapEx than we originally thought to ramp from 5,000 to 10,000 because we're getting smarter with efficiency improvements. Additionally, they want to really you know, iron out production of 5,000 units per week and get all the equipment and infrastructure setting up and running for that before they take a step back and analyze how they can set up the next line of 5,000 and make it even more efficient. So I like that kind of take it slow, like let's learn from our mistakes on this first 5,000 unit per week run rate line and then make it a lot better and a lot more efficient for the next production line. Of course, Elon hops in and says, oh, well, if I had to guess on 2018 CapEx, I'd say it'd be about the same as 2017. Classic Elon. Loving this. The analyst also asked about China. It, what about a factory in China? Is that going to be any CapEx next year? Elon goes on to say, eh, I don't think so. China CapEx isn't going to be very minimal next year, if any, but it'll start big in 2019. So that's a big hint on when Tesla will be setting up its own factory in China. And they go on to say, it just makes sense to build a factory in China here. Like now they're building cars in California, shipping them across the ocean to China. That's super inefficient, first of all. Second of all, the Chinese government imposes massive tariffs on every car that's not built in China. So if they could build a car in China, they can avoid a 20 to 30% tariff on the vehicle, it becomes that much more competitive. And remember, Tesla's already kicking ass in China. If they can actually set up a manufacturing facility in the region, the tariff goes away, then they become even more competitive and more likely to grow sales in that market. But another interesting tidbit is Elon said, if they do build a factory in China, it will be about as, uh, it will be able to produce a couple hundred thousand cars per year. And those will be model Y and model three, not S and X, because they think they're a better fit for that market, I guess. Didn't really get that part, but interesting to know. Bernstein goes on to call out Elon Musk during the other capex question elon said well it kind of depends we could spend lower capex and grow slower or we could put higher capex and grow higher and the analyst is like why would you do that you know shouldn't you always be going to the max tesla's always growing as fast as possible like what this sounds like a new idea that you guys have to potentially slow capex not as fast as you want no it's not a new idea tesla's always been in a struggle of like man should we really try and convince the market that we can grow this fast and build this many cars this soon and raise that many billions to do it they're pushing the fine line of what the capex capital markets will accept. And that's why they're trying to figure out how much money do we need to raise? How fast do we want to grow? What's the market going to accept for our CapEx? And on top of that, 
what is our fiduciary duty to our shareholders to maintain enough of a cash cushion to be able to you know survive if let's say a recession hits or some other major issue but i think the biggest thing to note here is tesla is running an amazon model they want to and it's almost an amazon 2.0 model instead of running at break even to grow as fast as possible tesla is running at a loss and spending more than they're making to grow incredibly fast and elon goes on to note here guys look we no car company has ever scaled production as fast as we're going like Tesla, the debates we're having internally is whether we should scale Model 3 production to 10,000 units per week in nine months, 12 months, or 15 months. To any other producer, this is just like a flash in the pan. Tesla's moving so much faster than every other auto company for someone to come out and say like, oh, you guys are going slower than a slow, investing slower than we wanted. Guys, the market would freak out if Tesla said they wanted to raise $5 billion to start building a factory for the semi truck tomorrow. That's why they're not doing it. They want to do it, but it's just what the market will accept. RBC goes on to ask more about CapEx. Once again, Tesla's not giving too much here. But then Elon does give an interesting answer, which is, we want our robots, I guess it's not really related to the CapEx question, but he says, we want our robots to be moving faster than you can see them. You shouldn't even be able to see the robot moving. You should need a strobe light to see it. I didn't really get that part, but... I guess I just thought it was a cool fact. Oppenheimer, what percentage of sales are coming from you guys selling service loaners or used vehicles? Only a small single digit percentage, not too important of a question, but thought I'd throw it in. Guggenheim, asked about the solar business and if Model 3 battery pack production is constraining growth in the storage business. In terms of constraining growth in the storage business, JB goes on to answer, not really. They're pretty much two separate lines, maybe in the much, much longer term, you might see some battery constraint on which part of the business we go to, but for now they're pretty separate. In terms of the solar roof, both Elon and JB have it on their houses, they're using it. And the tricky part they said is, the reason why it's been slower to roll out than they've expected, I, they should have saw this coming, I don't know why, is that they're doing, it's you know, this is a really long product. You have on your roof for 30 years and they're trying to do that much stress testing on it in six months. And they think they can do it in six months, but not a shorter time period. So I guess that's what they're doing with these initial customers and is stress testing the product. And then they did go on to note, that they do plan on turning on their Buffalo, AKA Gigafactory 2 before the end of this year to start ramping production of the solar roof. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Elon goes on to close it out by saying, guys, the solar roof is going to be a behemoth when it, when it launches. I think it's going to be a significant piece of our business, but it's just taking longer to get off the ground. Pretty much like every Tesla product, you know, they hype it up, they get everybody like you and me too excited. And then the skeptics say, oh, they're late. It's never going to happen. And they finally do it three months later. And you know, whatever. That wraps it up. Those are my highlights from Tesla's Q3 2017 earnings conference call. Leave me a comment, questions, feedback, leave it below. I'm going to read, reply to all of them if I can. Love to know what you guys thought of the quarter. That's HyperChange. I'll see you guys next Tesla earnings. Peace.